you're finding your seat. Would you also uh, find your copy of God's Word and join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you would find verses uh, 16 and 17, that's where we're going to be as we're preaching through the book of 1 Corinthians. Now, one of the most important things a a Christian can know about themselves is who they are in Christ Jesus. And so, kind of about that song we just sang, and as Kyle was just saying, that uh, we are His, we belong to Him. And and it's very important for every Christian to know, uh, for every believer to know who they are. In Christ, one of the main reasons of that is, is because that affects how you live, uh, who you are, and what you believe about yourself. It affects what you do uh, in a very profound way. Now, the Corinthian church, however, got these two uh, out of balance. Uh, so, who they were in Christ and how they behaved uh, didn't match, and that's unfortunate uh, because those two. Uh, need to match. They must match. And so uh, Paul, as he's addressing uh, this uh, church throughout this letter, uh, he's pointing out things that don't match. Uh, One of the things we looked at earlier in chapter 3 is they were behaving like lost people. But he's saying that's not who you are in Christ. And so who you are and how you behave uh, go hand in hand. And they, they, they must match. And this church, uh, it didn't, but that same problem still exists today. Who someone is in Christ and what they do, how they walk, how they behave, how they talk, things they participate in, oftentimes do not match. And that's unfortunate. And today, hopefully, maybe God will address uh, some of these things. And we'll have a better expectation of not only who we are in Christ, but a be- an expectation of what we are to do because of who we are. And so the title of today's message is Great Expectations. Uh, if you look with me in verse 16, we'll see an expectation here. Paul says this, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And so a very profound expectation we can see right here uh, as he addresses uh, this church about this issue in verse 16, we see an expectation for the church, which is simply this, know who you are. I mean, do you not know who you are? And so that's a, a great expectation for the church, to know who you are in Christ Jesus. He says you are God's temple is the very first thing that uh, he addresses. And so every believer in Corinth that gathered together to become the church was God's temple. And so as we're going to see, the temple has uh, uh, two aspects of it, right? So the temple is the believer's body, right? God's spirit dwells in you. And so making you, your body, the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. And then the church, as those gathered believers come together, then what that, what that is, is God's spirit dwells in the midst of that. And then Jesus Christ is lifted up and then they, you are God's temple. And so this is what he's telling the church here in Corinth. He says, you, this word you is plural. Every single one of you that are gathering together is God's temple, a dwelling place for God in the spirit, and you are God's temple. So that's a great expectation for the church to know that as we gather together, as God's people gather together, we are coming together as God's temple, uh, his dwelling place in the Holy Spirit. And so uh, the temple, though, that Paul is speaking of is the innermost part of the temple in the Old Testament that was known as the Holy of Holies. And so the Holy of Holies was the place where God would dwell at uh, temporary times. He would come down and dwell and manifest his presence by his spirit there. Uh, and it was very significant in the Old Testament temple. You, in fact, you had to go through some stuff to even, even before you get to that. You know, so as they were... Uh, Walking up if they wanted to come to worship, you know, these even the steps leading up to the temple would remind you of what you were supposed to be doing. The steps were very uneven and scattered out, so it caused you to pay attention as you're making your way up to the temple. Not only that, so then once you would enter in, you go up on the Temple Mount, and this was the court of the Gentiles. And so you see this outer section there, and then you would uh, go in even further, and you would have the court of the men and women, and then then, then you would have a priestly court that was beyond the court of men, and then you would go in, and then uh, it just worked its way in, and then you would have the Holy of Holies. And this was where only the high priest would be able to go in. And so we're going to talk about that here in a moment. And uh, this is the very place where God would dwell. And they could only go in once a year through some specific instructions that they had to follow. 
And Paul is now saying, the church, you are this temple. Do you not know this? And so this first great expectation is for the church, knowing that you are uh, this temple. And uh, where God would manifest his presence with his people. Now, I'd like to do a couple things, and I'd like to first kind of look at see how this, would, how this worked in the Old Testament and how it's fulfilled in the New Testament. Y'all good with that? Everybody do that? Okay, so we're, we're going to do that. Um, and so let me point out some, how this kind of worked in the Old Testament. Uh, two things to keep in mind. All right, so keep these two things in mind before we go back. So the first deal is uh, the temple belongs to God. So if you look at some of these instructions and you say, well, some of these things are, you know, kind of, kind of different. Well, guess what? The owner can make them up, right? So the temple belongs to God. And I'm telling you, that same implication applies in the New Testament we're going to look at. So you need to keep in mind the temp, he is the owner. Do you not know that you are God's temple ownership? And so that's the first thing to keep in mind. Not only that, but because God is holy, holy, holy. That is plain throughout the Bible. Because God is holy, 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 perfectly set apart. Then where he dwells is going to be perfectly set apart. He is going to set apart his dwelling place. So those two things you need to keep in mind. He is the owner. And because he is holy, where he's going to manifest his presence becomes holy. And so we're going to see that as we look, look back in the Old Testament. And so here's some examples of uh, his dwelling place being holy. Um, one of our first one's found in Exodus 28. As the, the tabernacle is being constructed, uh, there were specific instructions on how to do that. So Exodus 28, verse uh, 31 through 36 is going to show us how the priests had these specific instructions on how they could go in. And so let me uh, read for us here in Exodus chapter 28. Verse 31, it says this, You shall make the robe of the ephod of all blue. There shall be an opening for his head in the middle of it. It shall have a a woven binding all around its opening, like the opening in a coat of mail, so that it does not tear. And so as he's giving out these instructions, keep in mind, this is what they got to put on and wear before they can even go in to God's presence. And verse 33 says this, And upon its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet all around its hem, and bells of gold between them all around, a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe all around. Look at verse 35. And it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers, and its sound will be heard when he goes into the holy place, so the holy of holies, before the Lord, and when he comes out, look at this, that he may not die. You say, my goodness. Man, you've got to even dress a certain way before you go in there? Yes, because God is holy, 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 where he's going to manifest his presence is going to be holy. And so you couldn't just go in any way that you wanted to go in. You had to follow these specific instructions, and it was a reverence of God's holiness that they had to follow. In fact, the next verse says this in 36, You shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave it on it, like the engraving of a signet that says this, Holiness to the Lord. That's a very important concept for these priests because these priests also belong to God. Holiness to the Lord. In fact, uh, would you like to see a little picture of kind of maybe what this looked like? You've got a picture of a priest. Can we go ahead and put that on the screen here? And so this is an, a depiction of what this could have looked like. So that you see the top part, it had an opening for the head. You would slip that on, right? You see that there's a breastplate there with 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. You see the sash. If you make your way to the bottom, you'll see the pomegranate and the bells going all around the hem. Now, it was a good thing if you heard the bells when they went in. It was a very bad thing if you could not hear the jingling. Because what did that mean if you couldn't hear some jingling going on in there? He got dead. Is what, is, uh, what he, so he, he died. And so if you did not go in there a certain way, then uh, you didn't honor the holy place. It was very bad for you. In fact, you notice he doesn't even have any sandals on. You remember what God said to Moses? When it, the burning bush passes, Moses, take your sandals off your feet because you are standing on what? Y'all know this. Holy ground. Man, y'all are doing awesome this morning. I think it's going to be a great day. This is going to be very good. Because God is holy, 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 where he would manifest his presence. Even if it's in a burning bush, you would honor that place as holy. And so the priests, they would have certain ways before they could even go in God's presence, right? Not only that, you had to go through a lot of stuff to even get there, then dress a certain way. And so God will be reverenced. 
So holiness is to the Lord. And so that plate of gold they would have on that for, on their forehead. So they, they would have that kind of turban looking deal up there. And then they had that gold plate and it would be inscribed in Hebrew this way. They go backwards. Holiness to the Lord. And so it's even God would mark it on his people. Holiness to me. And so they were, they were set apart. Even the priests were set apart. Now, what also was set apart with the priests is, is only the high priest could do this. And so the way the priestly system worked is you had to be of the lineage of, of Aaron. And so if you were of the lineage of Aaron, Aaron and his descendants, Moses' brother, if you were to follow that line, you would become the high, you were the high priest. But to be a priest itself, you had to be from the tribe of Levi. But specifically, if you were from Aaron's, Aaron's lineage, you, would be, you were known as the high priest. And it was only the high priest that could go into the Holy of Holies only one time a year. And you had to better make sure that you were dressed accordingly and that you had all this stuff done or it was very, very bad for you. And then if you were a priest uh, of the tribe of Levi, you would minister the other temple temple things. But only the high priest could go in. So you see this very narrow, very specific, set-apart way before you could even go on into the Holy of Holies. And so they could go in once a year, and that day that day that they could go in was known as the Day of Atonement, known today as Yom Kippur. Anybody heard, heard of that? Actually, if you were keeping track of that, that just took place on Friday night. And so it was the Day of Atonement. So, right, I mean, this was just happened a couple, and so many Jewish people across the world today, or over this weekend, had been observing this Day of Atonement. And this would be a perfect time for me to add that Day of Atonement was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so uh, all of this points to him. But let's, we're going to look at this, what, what they would do on the Day of Atonement. So uh, known as Yom Kippur, or Day of Atonement, they'd go in once a year. And what they would do when they would go in, before they, they would have already sacrificed a very spotless, very pure, the very best sacrifice that they could have had, they would have sacrificed that, and they would have taken the blood, and they would have gone in behind the veil, right, And then hopefully the bells were jingling as he's walking around in there. And then they would take that blood and they would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. Now the mercy seat was on top of the Ark of the Covenant. It had two cherubim facing one another that was sitting on top. These angels that were sculpted, they would be facing each other. You'd have that, the top part in gold, mercy seat. And then you would have the bottom part, the, uh, the box, right? And so, um, and so the Ark of the Covenant and in that, so you would find the, the Ten Commandments with the, that they were supposed to live under within the, God's covenant. And so amongst other things, and so the idea is, is that you would sprinkle the blood there, and then when God looks down, instead of him seeing the Ten Commandments, he sees the blood, and then the blood would push back God's wrath. It would push it back, and it would temporarily cover their sins, and they had to do this every year. And so every year, what you were reminded of, if you were God's people living in his, within his covenant at that time, you were reminded of your sin. Every single year, because the priest would make atonement for the sins of the people and for the sins of himself. And there was this reminder every single year uh, of, this, of this sin issue. But keep in mind, remember, because God is holy, where he dwells is holy. This place was set apart. They could not just go in any way they wanted. They could not just do whatever they wanted to do. And I'm going to bring out an example of what it looks like of when you go in just any way you want to do it. And so we're going to find this example in Leviticus chapter 10. And I'm going to begin in verse 1. And so Leviticus chapter 10, this is known as these two guys we're going to look at are known as Aaron's sons. And so they were the high priests. And so they were able to go in, and so behind the veil, and look here to Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1, it says this, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, so they're of the right lineage, they're going in, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, look at this, which he had not commanded. Remember who owns the temple? God. And so he had the instructions, and they were commandments, and you had to follow them. They did not. And in verse 2 it says this, So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Their priesthood ended just like that. The very moment they start tampering with God's holiness. They met a side of God that they did not want to see. Because God is holy where he dwells to be holy, and you can't just go in any way you want to go in and start doing whatever you want to do. And see, this is where the church has lost sight of it, of God's holiness. I'm just going to depend on his mercy, and I'll just kind of continue in this sin, and I'll just kind of move on in there, and I'm going to lean into his mercy every time I mess up. 
I'm just telling you, you're going to meet a side of God's holiness that you're not going to like either. If you're, that's your mindset or your attitude going into sin. And, but look what Moses says back to Aaron after this happens. Verse 3, And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. That's his message to them today, then, and it's his message today. If you're going to come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and I will be glorified. Or you will meet a side of my holiness that's not going to end up good for you. But see, Christians, so we, we, and we hold to the, the, the doctrine that once saved is always saved. And that is very biblical. But what is not biblical is the mindset going in, well, because I'm saved, I'm just going to trample on the blood of Christ. And I'm going to lean into God's mercy. And I'm going to dabble in this sin and say it's all covered in the blood. And I'm just going to tell you, you're going to run in to God's mercy. Ask them if that's a good idea. If they were to come down here and talk to us today, their message would be a lot stronger than mine. If, they could, if you could ask them about God's holiness, I assure you it would be a message that would be very, very sobering. And it is. It should be. God's holiness is something that, that's not just we just treat any way that we just want to treat. And so, in fact, if you go to Leviticus chapter 16, God speaks to Aaron again about this issue, or Moses again on this issue. Leviticus 16, this is where you find the instructions for the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And Leviticus 16 verse 1 says this. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they had offered profane fire before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die, for I will appear in the clouds above the mercy seat. I'm going to come, I'm going to manifest my presence above the mercy seat. And Aaron, if you do not want to end up like your sons, you can't just come in anytime you want. You can't just do anything you want to do. I must be regarded as holy, and the way you come in needs to be the way I command. You can't just come in any way you want. What was the one thing that we kept in mind, remember? Why? God owns it. He owns the temple. And if you're going to just defile the temple or go in and do whatever you want to the temple, it would be very bad for you because he's the owner. And that's a mindset I want to drag into the New Testament as we look at uh, some of these things. But before I do that, what you need to understand is, so the difference is, so when Paul was telling them, do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? So how does this work now? And so that's one of the things we're going to start moving into. Well, how it worked then, if you notice, the difference is God dwelt among his people. He would dwell among his people, right? And so a very, very different concept from the Old Testament to the New. So that sacrificial system was put in place. If you wanted to go in his presence, right, then you would follow the sacrificial system, push back God's wrath. You would follow that, which all pointed to Jesus Christ. And then, remember, he's dwelling among, and then you could go to God and go into his presence. Now, uh... The, the, the sacrifices, again, had to be spotless and all those things, the whole sacrificial system, you can find in Leviticus, and you would walk through that. Okay? And so he would dwell among his people. What Paul is saying now, he says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Here, and see, I, I think it's better this way. Because in the Old Testament, maybe this is how it worked. Maybe you popped up out of your tent or whatever you did that morning, stretched a little bit, looked, said, man, the weather's nice outside like it is today. And you think, man, I, I think it's going to be a good day. And then you look over there at the tabernacle, and then you don't see a cloud. Or if you walked out at night, you don't see a pillar of fire. And you think, man, God's not in the house today. All right, go about your business. Or you walk outside, and you look over there, kind of gaze, and you say, hey, it's a good day. God's in the house. But guess what today when you wake up, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ? He in the house. Every single day, if you've given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, he's not just dwelling among his people. He's dwelling inside of his people. And God's people, that's an expectation for the church. You need to know that. And that is a great expectation for God's church to understand he's not just dwelling among his people. God is dwelling in his people. Your body then becomes the holy of holies, the most sacred space on earth because God is then dwelling it because he is holy, holy. Where he manifests his presence should be holy, holy, holy. And it's set apart and then your body then becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's a good thing because no matter where, wherever I go every day, I don't have to worry is God in the house or not. He is in the house. And when God's people gather together, for worship, corporately, for prayer, for fellowship, all those things. And guess what? God is in the house. 
And that is a very, very good thing. And so I kind of prefer the New Testament. We kind of look back at the Old Testament and say, well, they kind of had a different way it worked. You could see them. And so there were some benefits that they had that I think was pretty good, but I think it's far greater in the New Testament as he fulfilled the prophecy of Joel, and I'm going to send my spirit and dwell in you. And that's what Peter preached in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. This has now been fulfilled in your hearing. And about 3,000 people found out that the way is through Jesus Christ, and then God dwelt in the house. For the first time they had an understanding, oh, he's not in that temple. He's in this temple. And that's a very incredible thing. So that is a great expectation for the church. And so as we look at that, so we look at the Old Testament, brief overview. Let's look at what it does in the New Testament. And a great place to look in Hebrews, if you want to find out some more information on the Old Testament, say, man, I'm having a hard time understanding this. In your personal quiet time, personal study, go to Hebrews, and you will see an incredible light being shed on the Old Testament from the perspective of the New Testament as it's fulfilled in Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so let me point out a passage of this in Hebrews. It's in, found in Hebrews chapter 9, and it's in verse, I'm going to begin with verse 11. So remember, we talked about the high priest, right? The, 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 the lineage of Aaron. But Hebrews is all about how Jesus is better than all these different things. And so notice in verse 11 of chapter 9, it says this, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater, notice that, and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. So it's not only fulfilled in Jesus Christ, it's all better than what it used to be. And it's more perfect. And verse 12, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place, the holy of holies, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And redemption is eternal. It is a once saved, always deal, because redemption is eternal. It's not redemption if it's not eternal, if you can lose it. And then it goes on in verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purity of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who brought through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. There it is now how it works in the New Testament. Jesus Christ fulfilled it all once and for all. He doesn't got to go to the cross once every year to be a reminder of sins. When he went to the cross, he paid for the sin debt in full, past, present, and future. All of his work being applied to those who would call out on his name for their salvation, his provision being eternal redemption for them for all time. And that is an incredible, profound truth. And that's why we don't practice the sacrificial system today. Because it's been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. What did he say on the cross? It is finished. To tell style, no more down payment, this, there, no more COD, no, you don't have to add to this, it is done. And then when he died his death on the cross, he, he went and he paid for the sin debt of all people. His sacrifice was spotless. It was the very, very best. It had not been tainted or marred by sin in any way. And the wages of sin is death for you and so for us. And so he paid that penalty for us. He went to the tomb, stayed there three days, and then rose again because the sacrifice was good. The sacrifice was the very best. The sacrifice was spotless. And then when he rises, he ascends into heaven, and this is what he does. He sits down at the right hand of the Father. It is finished. There is nothing left to do. It is done. The only way you are going to have your sins atoned for is if you call out on the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. There is nothing else you can do. It takes a spotless sacrifice. And guess what? You've already been tainted by sin. The moment you were born, you were tainted into sin. Because we have all inherited this sin nature except for one, Jesus Christ. And the only way you can have that atoned for is if you call out on Jesus Christ and you ask him to save you. And as you do that, he looks at this repentant heart and all of his righteousness becomes yours. He takes your sin and extends to you grace, mercy, righteousness, forgiveness. And that is an incredible truth. And all of the Old Testament system was then fulfilled. And that's why the author of Hebrews is going back over and over again. Because as those priests and those Jews were leaving the faith, going back there, he says, what are you doing? It's all, there's nothing. You can keep doing that. 
but the, no blood of a bull, no blood of a calf, no ash of a heifer. I don't care how much blood it is can be sprinkled on your behalf to make you clean. There's only one person that can make you clean. There's only one name that under which under heaven that all men must be saved, and that is Jesus Christ. There is nothing you can do. There is nothing I can do. You say, well, preacher, I, I, I kind of see what you're saying, but what about the stuff I can, you know, the stuff I've done that is good? Your righteousness and my righteousness in the sight of God is not righteous. The only righteousness in the sight of God that pleases him is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. There ain't enough poor people you could feed. There ain't enough money you can dish out to make up for your sin problem. The only one that may make up for your sin problem is Jesus Christ. And I'm trying to beat that in as much as I can because I want you to leave today knowing there is no other way but Jesus. John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except through me. You can't go around him. You can't go over him. You can't go underneath him. You can't try to go in by yourself. Can't go through the back door, back window, in the basement. You got to go through Jesus Christ. There's no way around it. And if you don't, then guess what? One day when you stand before God Almighty and he looks at you and says, and he's going to judge you by his standard, then guess what? You're going to be found guilty. Guilty. But if you have given your heart and life to Jesus Christ and you go to stand before God one day, when he looks at you, he says, you have been forgiven. Your righteousness. Because you have the blood of Jesus, his work, everything he's accomplished, his performance, not yours, bound and tied to your life, and he says, forgiven, justified. And here's the good thing. Amongst other religions, other religions do that at the end. You've got to do all these things, and then at the very end, get justified. The good thing about Christianity is he justifies you before the performance. As soon as you call out on him, he justifies you, and then you can serve him in incredible freedom. But so many people today are damaging this because they say, I've got this freedom in Christ. Well, I'm telling you, uh, you're going to meet a side of God's holiness if that's your attitude, and it's going to be bad news for you. We can't lose sight of his holiness because of the freedom we have in Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to neglect or downput the freedom in Christ. It is incredible. It is absolutely astounding, incredible. This is not a legalistic kind of message. There is incredible amounts of freedom in Christ. But I'm telling you, God is still holy as he was in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. The same God exists there as he does today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He has not changed. And so that's one, that's, and, but I'm telling you, people have lost sight of that, and they think, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to sin and do it willfully, and I'm going to try to lean into God's mercy. And I'm going to say, you're going to lean into his holiness if that's your attitude, that is your, if, that, if that's you. And so the incredible thing about Jesus is, is that when he, when he ascended to heaven, sat down at the right hand of the Father, he extended the, the promise of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit. And then the, the church, when it was born in Acts chapter 2, now the Spirit as he came, now the believers become the temple. And that is an incredible, astounding truth for New Testament believers. It is incredible. And so and as he does that, and as the Holy Spirit indwells you, and now your body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit, this is the, this is the truth Paul's trying to get across. And that is the great expectation for the church. Do you not know who you are? That you are the temple of God? And that his Holy Spirit dwells in you. I heard of a story uh, sometime back about a guy um, who just became a believer, but he was struggling with alcohol, alcohol and problems like that. And, you know, and he's seeing some stuff in the New Testament about kind of, you know, passage that may kind of lean towards that, you know, alcohol may be okay and some of those things. And so he goes to ask the guy that, that was kind of mentoring him. And, and uh, you know, he, and he says, you know, what, what's, what's, what's the deal here? You know, can I... Can I do this? Can I not? You know, I've had problems with it, but, you know, uh, you know, now what? And so the church he was attending at had a liquor store right across the street, kind of like ours. And, uh, and so he, he, he was right, right across the street. And so he said, the guy says to him, well, would you go into such and such place to get you a, a you know, 40 ounce or whatever you do, a tall boy, and get that, and then come in the sanctuary and sit down in front of the sanctuary and drink that? And that guy said, no way, man, you're crazy. I, man, no. He goes, why? He goes, man, God would strike me dead if I did that. That's his response, right? Uh, so anyway, so dealing with what he said, the guy said, you know, where you gather for worship is not the temple. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And for the first time, he understood that truth. And guess what? God is the owner. 
You can't just treat that temple just any way you want to treat it. And you can't just do whatever you want. I'm free in Christ, so I'm going to get it tattooed across my face. Freedom in Christ, or do whatever I want. I'm just telling you, if you're doing things but not going to the owner, I'm just, I'm just telling you, you're leaning into his holiness. You're leaning into his holiness because you can't mess with God's temple any way you want. Because it's his. And that's, in fact, that's who a New Testament believer is. You belong, everything, your heart, mind, body, soul belongs to him. Paul points this out later in this letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let me read a a verse to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says this in verse 18. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know, you know, you hear the sound of that question? See, he's doing the same thing he did in chapter 3. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are who? Which are God's. They belong to him. See, God never gave up ownership of his temple. He didn't give it up in the Old Testament, and he dang sure didn't give it up in the New Testament. Because God is holy, 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 where he dwells must be holy, holy, holy. That's why all throughout the scriptures you'll see where he says, Be holy, for I am holy, as he talks to his people. You mean I can't just do whatever I want to do now that I'm a Christian? No, you're not your own. You've given up your rights if you're professing Messiah, if you're professing Jesus Christ. You've given it all up to follow him. And so everything must be going through the master. That's how we live. In fact, we're bond slaves of Jesus Christ. He is the master. You have no right. I have no rights. We get to now fulfill his plan and purpose as, as we surrender that over to him as he works in and through our life. And I'm just telling you, and if you'll live that way and have that mindset, that's an incredible way to live. You will stick out like a sore thumb, I assure you, but I'm telling you the church needs to. And today the church now has more uh, opportunity than ever to stick out. You know, used to, there was social pressure. Right? You had social pressure on the church to be, at, to be at church, right? All around you, it was ex- just expected, right? You could not be a business owner and not be shown at church, right? So I know thousands of people used to come here or whatever, but I, I highly doubt they were all Christians. I don't know. That's God's place. I'm content with leaving that to him, but I'm telling you, churches were filled at one time because of the social pressure. It would destroy your business if you went to church and you weren't seen because the social pressure. Now there's an opportunity today more than ever to stick out. See, then you kind of blend it in. But now if you live according to biblical convictions and stand on the Bible, you will stick out. I assure you. And that is a very good thing, that we shine like lights in a generation who desperately needs to see the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the way New Testament believers need to live and to take care of the temple. So, great expectation for the church to know who you are and know how to behave because of who you are. And that is a great expectation for us to, to see. So, all right, so there's a great expectation for the church. Let me go to the next one. A great expectation that you can expect from God. And you can find that in verse 17. Because if you're going to say, you know what, I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. I hear what you're saying, but I'm just going to kind of do it. Well, here's an expectation from God that you can expect in verse 17. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. You say, dang, preacher, why are you doing all this today? What's gotten underneath your skin? Nothing. I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. I thought the weather was nice today, and I thought it was, I think it's awesome. I'm just preaching the next text in the Bible. Y'all seen where I'm going? I'm just dealing with the next text, and this is what God says in his word. I'm just preaching to you the Bible, my responsibility, and that's an expectation. If you're going to try to, you know, you're thinking you're going to lean into his mercy, I'm telling you, if you're just going to destroy the temple, then guess what? The same word he says for if you're going to destroy the temple, that same word he uses for how he's going to treat you. You treat my temple this way, I'm going to take the same way you treated it and treat you that way. Because now you're messing with the owner and you're poking the holiness of God and that's not a good thing. That is not a very good thing. And so that word defile, it does mean to destroy. And so the same word there is used. And so what does that mean to destroy God's temple? Let me just walk through a few things so we can have an understanding. What what in the world does that mean? Well, for the Jews, let me tell you what, what it meant for them and I'll kind of bring it over. 
So if the temple was corrupted in anything in any kind of way, they considered it, I mean, destroyed in their mind. So if it was if the temple was corrupted, if anything inside was damaged, uh, or the priests neglected their duties, then uh, man, and then and that neglect led into just destruction. And so they was man, the temple's just destroyed. They considered it. Um, in fact, when they were building the temple in Solomon's day, here's how they here's how they treated the temple. When they were building the temple, so we looked in Exodus that that tabernacle that would move. Well, it was put in God in David's mind to build a temple. God didn't let him build it. He let his son Solomon build it. And when he built it, it, it was incredible sight. I mean, you see it all the gold and lace bronze, and I mean, it was just incredibly beautiful. And but when they were building it. Instead of chiseling the stones on site, they would take the stones out away from where they were building it because they didn't want the sound of noisy tools to be in the holy place. Isn't that incredible? That they, 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 they considered it just so holy that they reverenced it so much that they didn't even want the sound of tools banging in where they would worship. So they did all the stones and chiseled all that off site and then brought it in. I'm just telling you, that's a great mindset of a way to treat the temple of God. And you say, well... You know, how do we do that? Paul's not talking about the temple in Jerusalem. Guess what temple he's talking about? Your body. He's talking about the church, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, people today, you know, they just look at the church or, you know, I'll just treat it any way that I want to and I'm about to step on some toes. I know it. But when you come into worship, we got it. We should reference it. If this is the place that we've said as a church body, we are going to come and worship, then shouldn't we reverence the place where we're going to worship God? See, today, I mean, it's, there's some things that were lost, I think, in the, from the previous generation that I think were pretty good, right? Dressing your best to church, right? Taking the hat off, doing all those things that you would just, that you would get yourself ready to worship God. Now, I know some churches today, they'll say, you know, just come however you want. And look, don't hear me say that you can't, you have to wear a suit here. I'm not saying that. But I am saying this. If you got the very best in your house, then why not bring the very best to God? We give that way, shouldn't we worship that way? And if given's worship, shouldn't we collectively gather ourselves and present something good to God? Or I know some churches will just come in your pajamas. We just want you here. Well, my response to that is you're going to worship to God in your underwear? What are you doing? We're going to worship the God of this universe and just not respect how we're going to do it? Now, I know the hat thing is a cultural thing because if you go to Israel, you go over there, and if you're going to worship a holy site in the Middle East, then you put a hat on. Right, So this is a cultural thing, but if we've said this is the way that we're going to reverence God, I think that we should follow along with that. And if you're over there and you're going to go into a church there, then maybe you should put it on. If that's the, if that's the way to reverence God there, then you, we should do that. And so I'm just telling you, the way that we worship God matters, and we should be bringing our very best. It's not just an Old Testament principle. It's a Bible principle that you will find all throughout, that when we worship him, we just give him our very best. And that is the mindset, I believe, of a New Testament believer, the way it should be. So that's what it would mean. So, so this, destroying the temple for, for them, let's look at a little bit. So for the church, how could we destroy the temple today? Well, you could destroy, destroy the, the church temple uh, by spreading division. Right? So if you're going to treat it that way and you're going to seek to destroy it that way, spreading divisions is, is a good way to lean into God's holiness, if that's what you're going to do. Gospel, leading others astray away from Jesus Christ. If you're going to lead someone away from Jesus Christ, you're going to poke God's holiness, I assure you. Teaching false doctrine. If you're going to get away from the Bible and begin teaching other things, you're going to either add to or take away from it, you are going to start poking God's holiness. Um, if you are, uh, I, I threw this in there, lukewarm. And you say, well, how in the world is lukewarm destroying the simple? Well, because God, every time you see his people would start being, eh, about God, it never ended up good for them. In fact, they would come to the temple and they'd just be like, eh, they were offering sacrifices, just going through the routine. And God says, stop it. This is not what I'm after. I'm after the heart. Sacrifice I do not seek, but a willing heart of obedience is what I seek, is the will of God. And I'll tell you, Christians do the same thing today. I'm just going to check this off and just come on into church and just, just check this box off and do whatever I want to do. And I'm going to... I'm telling you, you're lukewarm. He's going to spit you out of, your, out of his mouth at some point. And again, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. So you can get mad at me, but that's fine. But I'm just telling you, lukewarm is a way of poking God's holiness as well. He says, I wish you were either hot, I wish you were cold, but this lukewarm makes me want to vomit. And I'm telling you, the church needs to quit being lukewarm today. 
Would you agree with that? Would you at least give me that, that there should be some sort of hotness or coldness in the church? There is no telling what God can do through a, some, through a hot or cold temple for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, that would be an incredible thing. So that's for the church. Well, how could you destroy your body? Well, I've mentioned a few things. Doing, uh, just treating your body however you want to do it, right? I'm not going to consult the owner. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. That's a way that you can poke God's holiness, I'm, I assure you. Because what you start getting off into that is you start thinking it's yours. And uh, the moment you find out it's God's may not be a good thing. And so right now, you know, you can consider some of these things. Drugs and alcohol is a way to damage your body physically. I'm telling you, there's no way to cut years off your life even more sooner than to destroy the temple, right? Every sin, as Paul said, is outside the body. But even sexual sin damages your own body. So even involved in sexual sin and doing sexual immorality and all those things is a way to poke God's holiness if that's what you're dragging his temple into. So you need to consult the owner. I know that's not a popular message today, but I, I guarantee you the church needs to be on board with that. They have to be. Is there any affirmation in the room over just some things I just said that are basic biblical principles? You do that? Okay. Thank you. And so that's what you can expect. If you start poking into God's holiness and you start destroying that, then guess what? The same way you treated it, the temple is the same way he'll treat you. And that's just the Bible. God will not be mocked by anybody. Understand? God will not be mocked by anybody, especially his people. Especially his people. He will not be mocked. You will poke his holiness and that will not be good. And so, um, what does that mean for us? What do we do with, with all this today? Well, you say, well, does that deal with just priests? Does it deal with the Old Testament? Let me lead you one final verse before we kind of wrap this whole thing up. And it's found in 1 Peter uh, chapter, chapter 1. And it says this in verse 15. 1 Peter 1, 15. He says, but as he who called you is holy... You also be holy, look at this, in all your conduct. You know, Paul talked about everything that we do should be done as unto the Lord for the glory of Jesus Christ. Be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy, here's the reason, because I am holy, for I am holy. So because God is holy, holy, where he dwells must be that way. And then he goes in and says, this is squashes all argument about it being just applied to Old Testament priests. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says this, But you are a chosen generation. Look at this, a royal priesthood. Every believer has a priesthood before God. The present day priest is every single Christian. Why? Because where is the temple? Where is God dwelling and manifesting his Holy Spirit, his presence? In your body, in you. Every single person has a priesthood before God. And holy nation... Look at this. His own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people, Gentiles, but now are the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. See, God's the same as he was in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And there have been people throughout time, unfortunately, have poked God's holiness and found out the wrong way. I heard of a story a while back. Uh, of an unnamed church that's not too far from here, uh, still in Texas, but the uh, pastor got a little too friendly with one of the deacon's wives and got a little too close, and uh, they started uh, having an affair. Today people call that a moral failure. That's, they, they had an affair. And then they take it so much to the far as is now they're going to split up from their wives, leave, leave each other's spouses, and then move in together. And on the day that they decide to do that, that deacon takes a gun, shows up at the, that their house where they're moving into, kills both of them, and then turns it on himself. Would you say that's maybe destroying God's temple? They were doing that, and guess what? The way God treated the temple is the same way he treated... If you're going to drag God's name through the mud, and if you're going to ruin the witness of Jesus Christ in such a way, I'm just telling you, you can poke God's holiness and it not end up for you very well. And I'm just telling you, God's holiness still exists today. If you're going to just think, I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. I'll bring division in the church. I'll do whatever I want to do. I'm just telling you, you need to be careful. You, might, you think you're leaning into his mercy. But if that's the attitude you have, you're going to lean into his holiness.
As we get ready to prepare for this last song, as we, we close up here, let me bring down a few things. Do you know who you are? That was the original question Paul asked. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and God's spirit dwells in you? Well, hopefully today, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you would know this is who you are. And because of that, it would dictate how you live your life. How it would dictate I live my life. This is for every believer. And so uh, Paul says later uh, in Second Corinthians, another letter he wrote to his church, he says this, Knowing therefore the terror, terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Because of what the church knows about who God is, then guess what they do? They persuade others. And I'm just telling you, there is a way that you can find mercy and grace, all these things that we talked about in Jesus Christ, because that's where God's holiness and his mercy came at a meeting point, was at the cross. God's holiness dictated that that his own one and only son had to die for sin. That should tell you enough how God feels about sin. But his mercy is also there because that's where you can find incredible, abounding mercy and grace in Jesus Christ. Because regardless of what you've done, you can call out on him today and he'll forgive you. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how bad it is. You say, preacher, i got a whole list of all these. I don't care. It was all forgiven at the cross. And if you come to him, I'm telling you, this is what he does. He takes it, whatever that is, it's so bad in your sight. I just tell you, we all got skeletons in our closet. I don't care who you are. And he can take all that and throw it in the sea of forgetfulness. And I don't care who you are, he can forgive you today. But if you're not going to do that, and I'm just telling you, the mercy and grace will run out at some point. And if you do not give your heart and life to Jesus Christ, then I'll tell you on one day, his holiness will come across and he'll cast all those out of his presence that have not given their heart and life to Jesus Christ. So today, if I were you, you've, I mean, you've, you've made the effort to come, you, you, you prayed, hopefully, you know, God speak to me, and maybe today God's speaking to you and says, you need to give your heart and life to my son, Jesus Christ. You need to have provision for your salvation. And I'm just telling you, if you'll do that today, there's an incredible, infinite amount of grace and mercy that can come your way today. As you call out on the only name under heaven that man can be saved, which is Jesus Christ. My plea to you today is this, because of what we know about the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Would you be persuaded today by God's Spirit to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ? And that would be an incredible day for you to experience. But I'm just telling you also this, the moment you come, it's not that God's holiness goes away. You can't just say, I'm going to do this and just begin doing whatever I want. You can ask many people throughout the Bible if that's a good decision, and they would tell you no. So an expectation for us, if you've already received God's mercy in that way that I just described, is, is this, to be holy just as he is holy. To take care of God's temple. To reverence it, to treat it the way that God is the owner and being a good steward of it. And I'm just telling you, in Christ, you have the power to do that. Because guess who's dwelling inside of you? God's Holy Spirit. Do you not know that you're in the temple of God and God's Spirit not dwells among you, dwells in you. In Christ, you have the power to do so. An expectation, if you're just going to abuse that mercy, is this. If you want to poke on God's holiness, that attitude, I'm telling you, I'm just going to depend on mercy every single time. It's not going to cut it. At some point, you're going to lean into it too far. And today, maybe you just need to come down before these steps and say, you know what, God, I, I think I've been doing that. And you've spoken to me today. And maybe you just need to come before these steps and pray and just tell God, look, I'm I'm sorry. Now I know. I know who I am. And you just commit to living in obedience to Jesus Christ and living a set-apart life out for him. That would be a great thing. Great expectations are before us today. But with the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us, he can meet every single one of them. And no greater, there's no greater way to do that than by gathering together with local believers. And so if you're not a part of a local family of believers today, my plea to you today is this. If you want to be a part of a Bible-believing church that is, that is committed to coming together and proclaiming the glorious majesties of Jesus Christ to a generation that desperately needs it, the invitation is wide open for you today to come be a part of this fellowship. And it's hard doing it out there by yourself. But maybe you can just bring your light in and we can shine a little bit brighter together. That invitation is open for you today. Great expectations. Let's commit to following God and how he has us lead us in this time. Would you stand to your feet right now and uh, invite you to come. If you need to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ today, that invitation is open for you today. 
If you need to come pray at these steps and just say, God, I forgive me for the attitude I've been living. If you'd like to join our fam- uh, family fellowship today, I invite you to make your way forward as we sing this next song. Once you come.